Well, we're looking at, of course, uh, the issues that you see us before you up on the screen, uh, the issues of transcendency, eminency, and eminency, and why these are all important uh, when it comes to the Word of God. As we'll see in Isaiah, as we'll get there in a moment, we're doing a little review this morning because um, I think we went through this a little too quickly last week, and uh, I think there were some folks that kind of missed the point of what we were trying to get across. We're looking at the inspiration of Scripture and the value of Scripture. Now, general revelation tells us that there is God, right? We look outside our windows and see that there is a creation. We must assume then that what? There's a creator. If there is an intelligent life, there must be an intelligent creator. Not general revelation. But specific revelation, how do you know anything about God? Only way you can know that is by God's word and God's revelation of that. So it creates a cycle, a circular problem. You have a low view of scripture, you have a low view of God. If you have a low view of God, it's because you have a low view of scripture. Otherwise, you're not studying the scripture to understand who God is. Now, we all think that we have a high view of God. And I would imagine that Isaiah believed he had a high view of God. Wouldn't you think so? He was a prophet of God. He probably thought, uh, you know, pretty highly and theologically about God. But when he came to finally see God, he saw God high and lifted up. He saw God exalted, and therefore he gives us that exalted view of God with the intent that now through the inspiration of God, through the inspiration of God's word, we can see through the words of God what Isaiah saw, and therefore create the same view of God. But it's only through the inspiration of scripture that we have that. Now, when we have scripture now, either through interpretation or translation, when God's theology, the theology or the knowledge of God is corrupted in any way by, uh, of course, bad um, interpretation or a very poor translation of text, we can see then that the God's view, view of God is then lowered. And really, that's a goal of liberalism. That's why liberalism, and through Satan, through liberalism, attacked the verbal plenary inspiration of God. Because it's his, the intent of liberalism was to create a low view of God and a low view of Scripture. Now, most of that comes from, of course, Roman Catholicism, who didn't want their church members anchored to the scriptures. They wanted their church members anchored to priestly and papal interpretation of the scriptures and, of course, the ongoing revelation that comes through the Pope. So Tyndale said if he had his way, the plowboy would know more of the scriptures uh, than, of course, the Pope. And, of course, we know that today. In many cases, that's the true the truth. Uh, Pope's not even saved. You know, whatever Billy Graham said, I don't think the Pope's a saved man, never have been. You can't believe what they believe and be born again. So as we look at these things this morning, uh, these three issues that you see up here, our intent in looking at them is to get a high view of God. With what outcome? What is our purpose? Understand who, God is. Understand who God is and then give us a high view of the scriptures. Otherwise, God's purpose of revelation 
his inspiration of his words is self-disclosure. He is revealing himself, what he wants, and his expectations of us. That's the will of God. So we come to this fact, first of all, about the transcendency of God. And if you can see up here, the fact that God is transcendent means that truly knowing or experiencing all of whom and what God is, is beyond, that's your first word there in your handout, or outside of the human ability to fully comprehend or understand apart from the illumination of his spirit. So apart from the illumination of his spirit, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter, or 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9, <clears throat> as he goes down through that text, he says, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. For they are spiritually discerned. And <clears throat> the spirit of man knows the spirit of man, right? But only the spirit of God knows God. And so the spirit of God, through his illumination of the words of God, gives us a high view of God. And therefore understanding that that high view of God is therefore the result of a high view of the inspiration of scripture. So therefore understanding that God is transcendent helps us to understand God's central purpose of Scripture and his inspiration is to accurately reveal himself in all of his glory so that believers might then glorify him. That is, we then reveal him to others who cannot see. We see God only through the Scriptures. And then it is our job then to reveal God, the God we see in the Scripture, to others by teaching and preaching right doctrine. So we glorify him to the best of our spirit-filled abilities. So the spirit of God teaches us through the word of God. We then as spirit-filled Christians, believer priests, then teach others what God has said in his word. This is what it means to labor in the word of doctrine. Now pastors, they're expected to labor in the word of doctrine. We have, of course, many pastors today, I don't, criticize them too harshly because they are bivocational in many cases. They don't have time to study the scriptures uh, as they should. The average study to any pre prepare for 40, 45 minutes of sermon is about 10 to 12 hours of study. Well, you put uh, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night in there, and you got 40 hours already. And then many of them are already bivocational. So to, to be able to do that, I think it's a good thing to have the men in the church every now and then preach, right? Then they come to understand how much work it is to, to do what uh, they have to do to prepare for that. And that's a lot of work. So therefore, an accurate understanding of God's transcendency gives us extremely high views of inspiration, inerrancy, and the infallibility of Scripture. So 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10, we've quoted, I has not seen, ear has not heard, it neither has entered into the, man the thing, in, into the heart of man the things which God has prepared them. Otherwise, man can't even imagine these things. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Then the second point, the fact that God is eminent, means that God is by his very nature and essence exalted far above and beyond, those are your two words there, any aspect or glory of created beings or things. So to understand the eminency of God is to hold an extremely exalted or high view of the person of God. Now, how many of you have seen God in person? You know? The only way that you can do that is see him through the eyes of inspired scripture. And that, of course, is what Isaiah gives us in Isaiah 6. So one cannot truly worship God apart from the proper understanding of an eminency. Why do we have such poor, weak, um, you know, lack of sincere worship today? Uh, because of the ignorance of who God is. Now, why do you suppose the... Egyptians, the mixed multitude that came out of Egypt along with the Jews, were able to persuade Aaron so quickly to erect a golden calf to represent Jehovah and the practices of paganism 
uh, in the worship standards of Jehovah, uh, why were they so easily persuaded? Ignorance. I mean, it had been 400 years now in the, in the Egyptian bondage and their, their ignorance of God, although they still believed in the one true God, they knew nothing of worship because they really knew nothing of God other than that he was the one true God. They <laughs> really didn't know much of him. Now they saw what he could do in Egypt. But they thought, well, this, let's just worship him as this supreme God of Israel was the bull. And so they simply said, well, this must be the true God then is the supreme God is the, the bull. And they were easily persuaded. Ignorance. Why do we have so much going on today in what we call evangelical Christianity, new evangelicalism, the emergent church? Why can, why can that kind of stuff go into local churches and not be stopped by the congregations? Ignorance of God. Shallow teaching, puppy dog sermons full of a lollipop truths, um, really uh, give people nothing. And so they have no discernment whatsoever. In fact, they like it. Now, why do they like it? Well, you know why. You have to listen to this stuff Sunday after Sunday. You know what it means to labor in the word of doctrine. It's hard work. It's hard work to give it, hard work to listen to it, hard work to learn it. I appreciate so much. I see folks taking notes and working so hard at trying to learn and remember all this stuff. It's hard. It, you know, that's what this is. We, we, it's called the work of the ministry. And that's what we are here to do. So one cannot truly worship God apart from understanding of his eminency. And uh, an accurate understanding of God's eminency gives us an extremely high view of inspiration and inerrancy and infallibility. And I think as this is the transition in Isaiah's view of God in Isaiah chapter 6. Otherwise, Isaiah didn't start out with this view. Right? By what he says after getting the vision that he gets, shows us the change, first of all, in his evaluation of who he is and his evaluation of who God is. And thereby, he makes a comparison. Right? So an accurate understanding of who God is, an accurate understanding of who we are, then brings us before God and understands the grace of God, really, in him giving to us what he has given us. First of all, the, the labor of God through the centuries to continue to give us some preservation of his words. Every single dispensation. We'll look at that later on in, Isaiah, in Psalm chapter 6. I believe talks here as silver is purified seven times. I believe God after every dispensation had to correct all of the false things that had been taught uh, in the world. Of course, we really have no written scripture until Moses. Now that's the age of the law. But God had to correct everything with every dispensation. So God purified his word through additional uh, revelation and correction uh, of false doctrines after every dispensation and, uh, of course, preserved his words. So Isaiah 6.1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and this is Adonai, uh, most probably the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, sitting upon a throne. And then what's the next few words? High and what? Lifted up. Now what do you think of when, when you see those words high and lifted up? What is that? That's an exalted view of God. He sees God in his prominent position of lordship and sovereignty. High and lifted up. Now this is the way the earthly kings tried to present themselves to their subjects. And of course they did that, that's what paganism did it, and even the aristocracy of Europe, they, they all did this. When people came in to approach them, they were to have their heads bowed, and this throne was always an exalted position uh, up there, uh, up before the people. And so they tried to copy to make themselves little gods. And that is, of course, the 
uh, issue of all the ancient pagan religions, and your European aristocracy believed they were descendants of the gods. That's the whole nation, notion of blue bloods. Didn't want to intermix uh, the uh, blood of uh, the god kings, if you will, with common people and the aristocracy. And so only the aristocracy could own and control property. That was feudalism. Uh, now we have a new feudalism uh, coming on, and it's called socialism. <laughs> and uh, the new aristocracy is, of course, those who promote it. So above it, it said, uh, the train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face, two. With twain, two, he covered his feet. And with twain, two, he did fly. And one cried, one, uh, one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. Otherwise, th this is essentially talking about the omnipresence of God. There is not one single place in the world, in the universe, where God's presence does not touch. The world is full of the glory of God. The glory of God is the radiant, visible attributes of God that touch everything in the universe and impact it to some degree. So, and it says, And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was uh, uh, in this room and the voice of God started speaking, and the building started shaking, the post, which are the structures that held the roof up, uh, started shaking, uh, I'd get a little concerned, right? And so that's why we had the fear of the Lord as the beginning of knowledge. And that is intended to reflect to us these things. Now, God is far beyond what we can imagine. And it's only through the study of Scripture that we get this high and exalted, this high and lifted up view of God. So what does Isaiah say? He said, I, whoa, I am undone. Now what does that mean? Isaiah came and he thought he had it all together. Right? I imagine he thought he was a pretty good God. I mean, after all, he was one of God's chosen prophets. And, uh, you know, uh, this is the pride of ministry. It happens to every single one of us. Particularly uh, pastors and evangelists and missionaries are are, uh, are uh, you know, this can be a problem for them. And uh, it is certainly true of every Christian. We, we think that somehow we're doing and living pretty good, and we look at ourselves, I don't live as bad as that person. That is uh, Romans chapter 2. And we think, we're, uh, we think we're pretty good. That's not what Isaiah does. Now, Isaiah sees himself for who he is by compared to who he sees God. He says, woe is me, I am undone. What does that mean? Literally, everything about me is unwrapped and exposed before God. I see myself as God sees me. And he says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. He didn't say, I just dwell amongst the people of unclean lips, and I got clean lips. He said, no. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. I think this is one of the uh, revelations of the character of man in his uh, uh, understanding of the uh, eminency of God, uh, that God is beyond, that we understand just how far short of the glory of God we've really come. And uh, every one of us are that way. Now, the third one we've looked at is the eminent. Me, that God is imminent. It means that God is within the realm of possibility. It's within the realm of possibility for anyone to grasp a certain degree of both intellectual knowledge, the gnosis of God, and intimate and personal experiential knowledge of God. That's the epigenosis. Now, I've given you this illustration before. I'll do it again. Gnosis is to know God intellectually. I believe a lot of people who know a lot of theology know God theologically, intellectually. But the transition of that knowledge to the heart is the epigenosis knowledge. That is knowing God intimately. Not just that we know about God, we know of God, 
We know him in a personal, intimate, relational sense. That's the epigenosis knowledge of God. The fact that God is omnipresent insists that God is also eminent, <coughs> or he's everywhere. Now, we're going to go over to you know, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23 and 24. God says here, I am a God what? At hand. I'm a God at hand. What's that mean? You can reach out and touch me. I'm close by. You know, somebody, some people, God, I know you're way up there in the sky somewhere and uh, out in outer space perhaps. And, and if, you're, if you're not too busy, I've got something I'd like to I'll talk to you about. Well, what does that show you in the ignorance of God? God's right there. You, you don't have to cry out to him as, as uh, Elijah did with the prophets of Baal. He says, shout louder. Maybe he's on a vacation somewhere. Or maybe he's sleeping. You know, that's not the case with God. He is at hand. So I am at a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not what? A God far off. Now that, of course, is what, uh, again, Elijah was doing. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Saith the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Don't you think that'd be a good verse of scripture to put over the top of your television screen? Or on the bedroom wall of your teenager? So they could see it every day or even for yourself just to remind yourself that there are no secret places where you can hide from God. There's nothing that is outside of his vision. And uh, he said, do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Colossians 1.15 Talking here about Jesus Christ, the, the incarnate Son of God. He says, who is the image of the invisible God? Now, what image were Adam and Eve created? In God's image, right. Now, when they fell in sin, they lost that image. It was defaced, not erased. Calvinist would say it's erased. Their doctrine of total depravity says that man is so... Um, so depraved now that he can't even make a moral decision. And my answer to that is not everybody is a bank robbery, robber. Not everybody is a murderer. Not everybody is a, a pervert. You know, uh, often, many times, people do good things, even when they're lost people. So the, the text here is that Jesus was created in the perfect image of God, and he retained that image of God in his humanity throughout his life. He was sinless. So the firstborn of every creature. Now remember we have two firstborns in this text. He is firstborn as a creator. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Visible and invisible. That's transcendency. He, we have all of these in this text. And so he, he is the creator and therefore he is sovereign over all. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him. That's eminency. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. That's eminency. Otherwise, he's the one that holds it all together. He is right there. Now, that's a high view of God. And you understand that the second God ceases to do what Colossians 1, 15 through 17 says, does, says, this world, this universe is going to fall apart. There's an order in the universe. Now, yes, there is also chaos in the universe due to the fall, but that God didn't create it that way. And yet God, even in that chaos, controls it. Otherwise, if it were not for God's in gracious interference and continual interference uh, with creation, Satan would literally wipe mankind and humanity off the face of the earth in a matter of a few minutes. it would be all done. So these truths then lead us to the terms inerrant and infallible. Many people think these terms are synonymous. Otherwise they mean the same thing. But they refer to di two different characteristics of the word of God. As you can see on your sheet there, inerrant means the word of God is what? Without error. 
without error. Infallible means the word of God is incapable of error. So your underlying word, your word there is error in both cases, but one says without error, while the other one is incapable of error. Now these are very important. Who wrote the word of God? Well, Paul and Jeremiah and uh, um, you know Isaiah and Daniel and, and James and John and Luke and Matthew, they wrote the word of God, right? They wrote the words God gave them. They were just the secretaries. God gave them the words to write. And so we must remember that because if we hold a high view of God, God isn't going to give them words that contradict one another. God's not going to give them things that are in error. They're going to be accurate. And if we find an error in the Bible, it's either because we have misunderstood it or God is correcting our understanding. Most of the cases, I would say, is just because we have misunderstand what God has said or the context of it. So therefore, these two terms, inerrant and infallible, are directly connected to the outcome of our understanding of the Greek word theonousis, which is, of course, inspired and as used in 2 Timothy 3.16. Now, here's a, here's a preface, or what we would call the conclusion, an inductive conclusion. And deductive means we have a premise, a major premise, minor pre premise, and a conclusion. Inductive means we gather all of the information, and the numerator is equal to the denominator, and when we gather all the scriptures on these, uh, any particular doctrine or doctrines, then we have the whole, and we can make and draw an inductive conclusion based upon the weight of the evidence of Scripture. So, so God is, since God is the sole author and the superintendent of his chosen words, then those chosen words must, that's a word you have there, be both without error and incapable of error. Why? Because God wrote them. God's the author of them. God is, he, he is not going to lie to us, so therefore they're without error. Second, God is impeccable. He cannot sin, and so therefore he is incapable. Of, the scripture is incapable of error. So since inspiration means God remains in union then with his inspired words, those inspired words must be equal with the character and nature of God. Now, we don't worship the Bible, but we give a high value to the Bible as the inspired words of God. Because God, re, 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 uh, God continues to maintain himself connected to his words. They're not disconnected from him. So there's power in the word. That's why the Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living. It's constantly working. So this must be true since both inerrancy and infallibility must align with the character and nature of God and his purpose in giving humanity his scriptures in the first place. Otherwise, he's not going to give us things that are lies. Now, the Bible does contain lies, the lies that Satan told, the lies that other people tell, and God accurately records those lies, but God didn't tell those lies. Now, any questions or comments so far? Got that all filled up? Olivia, did you get yours filled out? Okay, good. So, now here we come back to this issue. Inerrancy and infallibility can be exemplified in the incarnate word of God. Uh, Christ is impeccable. You know, first, uh, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, if the word of God is perfect, the incarnate word of God must also be perfect. Circular argument. If the incarnate word of God is perfect, then the inspired words of God must also be perfect. So this means Jesus was both without sin, impeccable, and incapable of sin. Uh, the fact that the character and nature of Christ is impeccable means that although Jesus was tempted externally, 
There was no internal desire for that with which he was tempted. Now, you have, you'll have theologians arguing and debating this issue all the time. I, I just, I, I just, you know, what you're talking about is nonsense. How could Jesus, who is God, be tempted from within? The very fact that there is a temptation from within is lust. If you have lust within, you've already sinned before you have ever sinned, committed an act. That's what Jesus said, right? A man who looketh upon a woman with what? Lust in his heart hath committed adultery with her. And so just the nature of lust, the nature of the ability to be tempted from within, not tempted from without, but tempted from within. Otherwise, want with what we are being tempted with uh, is sin in itself. That is a sin nature. Christ did not have a sin nature. So he is impeccable. Therefore, Jesus was both sinless and incapable of sinning. Since the scriptures are inspired by God, they can neither possess any air or even be capable of possessing air. Uh, any other position or derivative degree of departure from this perfection in inspiration of scripture is apostasy by that same degree. Now when you think of that with most people and the views they hold of scripture and why they choose various translations of the scripture, it is because a very low view of inspiration, a very low view of preservation, and a very low view of inerrancy and infallibility of scripture. Now, inerrancy is the first essential of all fundamentals if any form of dogmatism is ever to exist. Inerrancy is the area in which liberals particularly started becoming sneaky in their verbiage. Now, we have this today within the young fundamentalist movement. And uh, they say, yeah, here's what, uh, here's what the scripture said. Now, for, for hundreds and thousands of years, People have held to the same meaning of those particular verses of scripture. But they would say, well, yeah, but now we understand this better. And therefore, particularly on the issues of, of, of alcoholic beverages and social drinking, uh, here, what about this verse of scripture? So they find a verse of scripture, one or two, that is obscure, and then now begin to interpret all the verses of scripture to that. Now, you got one verse of scripture that said, don't drink alcohol, right? Or strong, don't drink wine or strong drink. And then you have other verses of scripture that says, go ahead and have a little wine for your stomach's sake. Well, those are contradictory, but you don't understand that there are two wines in the Bible. One wine is fermented and another is not fermented. And the uh, ancients now, we we discovered that there was uh, a couple of uh, Catholic monks who discovered how to do that, and they made Welsh's grape juice. Otherwise, they could sell it on on the, on the grocery store, and it would sit there in the shelves for months and years, and, and never ferment. They discovered one little secret that that was ancient, and that is, you boil it, and you kill off all the fermentation process in it, and then it will become a little bit more syrupy. And then in the syrupy process, you added water to it, and essentially you create grape juice again. So <laughs> we have that, we practice that, but mankind has become apparently ignorant of this. And they don't believe in the two wines you, or two, two, two wines in the Bible, one alcoholic, one not. But certainly that is what the scriptures teach. So, for instance, some will say that the word of God is inerrant in its purpose. You've all heard that. Well, I believe the Bible is in here in its purpose, which is faith and the practice of faith. They will say that the Bible is not a historical record or a scientific book. So they don't believe the Bible is inspired in history or if it says something that's contrary to science, they will disagree it. Do you know that the Bible has always said that the earth is round, not flat? And the Bible has told us often about the differences of the, of, uh, of, uh, the astrology and uh, astronomy, not astrology, astronomy and, and the location of the planets. 
You know that ancient people before the flood had more knowledge of these things than we do today. <laughs> and they have found charts in archaeological carved in stone that has knowledge of all of these things that for, for centuries have been in the dark ages by hidden by religious bigots who wouldn't read the Bible. Because it disagreed with their theology. I mean, one, one of the things you just don't want to let you do is let the Bible get in the way of your theology, right? But uh, that's kind of what's going on. So therefore, for them, the Bible need not, need, not, need not be without error regarding the accuracy in history or science. And this opens the door for the questioning or disregarding what the Bible says about anything other than the ambiguity of its intended purpose, which is faith and practice. Or salvation. Remember that's Barthian's position on inspiration. The center of the Bible is Jesus Christ and the doctrine of salvation. But uniquely, Barth couldn't even get that right because he was a Lutheran, believed in uh, Lutheran sociology. So, since all of the scripture is given by the inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16, there is plenary, full inerrancy connected to plenary. Full inspiration. So plenary just means full. In every matter. Plenary. History, science, um, everything you can imagine. The Bible speaks as the final authority on those issues. There are those who reject plenary inspiration. That's your underlying word. By translating the Greek word pas in 2 Timothy 3.16 as every rather than all. Now this is an important one. This needs to be addressed as to why it is absolutely an incorrect translation. The American Standard Version, translating mainly from the Westcott Hort Greek text of uh, AD 1881, translates 2 Timothy 3.16 like this. Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching. Instead of all scriptures given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. They just say it like this. Uh, every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching. Now, what is that open as well? Only those that are inspired are the ones that are profitable. Everything else, that there are some parts that are not inspired. By the way, that is called neo-orthodoxy. Neo-Orthodoxy believes the Bible contains the Word of God. It is not all the Word of God. Uh, so we can obviously see the many doors to false doctrine opened by this very faulty and corrupt translation of 2 Timothy 3.16. And this bad translation then can be made to mean that only those scriptures that are inspired are profitable, and thereby this translation allows for the denial of of plenary, full or all, inspiration. Now, of course, this faulty interpretation must also deny the fact that Paul is using the term scripture, 2 Timothy 3.15, to refer to all scripture collectively. It says there, and that from a child thou hast known what? The holy scriptures. What is he talking about? All the scriptures. That's context. The collective context of the word scriptures in 2 Timothy 3.15 defines the context of all in 2 Timothy 3.16. Context. Therefore, the American Standard trans Version translation corrupts the plenary intent of 2 Timothy 3.16, which the plenary intent means to show that the Bible, every word of the Bible is fully of God, inspired, breathed out by God. Every word. But their interpretation corrupts that plenary intent and corrupts the plenary intent of inerrancy in the same way. So although the grammar of the Greek text might allow for the American Standard Version translation of 2 Timothy 3.16, the context is not. And the context is referring to all scripture, not every scripture that's inspired. Now, another aspect of infallibility is that the word of God is said to be enduring forever. What? 
enduring forever. That's 1 Peter 1, 23 and 25. Now go over there with me. This is true of the incarnate word and the written word. Jesus Christ endures forever. The word of God endures forever. He says in 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of what? Corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Now what's he talking about? Well, he tells us right there. By the word, the Lagos of God. Okay, the, the Lagos or the Logos of God is incorruptible. Now that doesn't mean it hasn't been corrupted, but the original revelation of God is incorruptible because God will always correct it. Which liveth and abideth forever. It's a living book and it will abide forever. It's not going to change. Now, you ask somebody, well, where has God preserved his word? Well, they say, well, he's preserved his word in heaven. <laughs> Why does he need to preserve his word in heaven? It's not for people in heaven. It's for people on earth who don't know God. In heaven, everybody will know God. You're going to be able to see him and talk with him. He says, for all grass, a flesh is as grass, and, and all the glory of man is the flowers of grass. This grass withereth, and flower thereof falleth away. Look outside and see the brown grass. <laughs> Look at the flowers falling off, you know. And uh, But verse 25 starts with what word? But the word. Now, is that the same word up here in verse 23? By the word of God? That's the Lagos there. Now, that's not the same word here. By the word, this is the word rima. This is the individual utterances. The, by the word, the individual utterances of the Lord endureth forever. What's he talking about? He's talking about the, this individual utterances of the word of God. The logos of God is the, is, is, the, is the knowledge of who God is. It is the essence and character and nature and attributes of God. It is his knowledge of all things. That's the logos of God. Now we have the incarnate Lagos of God. That's John chapter 1, verse 1. But this is talking about the individual utterances of God in the word of God. But the word of the Lord, what? Endureth forever. Even these individual utterances of God endureth forever. And this is the word, again, rima, individual utterances, which by the gospel is preached unto you. God preserves both. There is one in heaven, but the Rima, God's individual utterances given to us in, by the inspiration of Scripture, is equally preserved of God. So therefore, the infallibility of Scripture intricately and essentially connects to the verbal plenary preservation of Scripture if the statements of 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25 are true. Therefore, the infallibility of Scripture means the authority, that's your underlined word there, the authority of Scripture cannot be broken. John 10, verse 35, it cannot be broken. It cannot be loosed or destroyed. Uh, why? Because God's, God is the superintendent of it. He's, now, we can have people who will corrupt the Word of God, but if you understand the word of God, it is your job to keep people from corrupting the scriptures. That is, propagating bad translations of the scriptures, uh, promoting false uh, textual positions, like the eclectic text position, uh, to stop those kind of things from being propagated and continued. Now again, as soon as this dispensation is over, and the beginning of the kingdom age, Jesus Christ is coming, and he'll fix it all again. That'll be the seventh purification of the word of God. And that is going to happen. Now, 